worship one more time. What a privilege it is. Thank you. 
the Lord didn't come to touch nobody. <laughs> Pastor Baby Young Brown, the Lord didn't touch him, but I called. <laughs> I help him, I help the Lord. <laughs> Let us pray. Our God and our Father, how we thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for smiling down upon us. Yes. Knowing, God, that we were unworthy, we didn't deserve it. Through your grace and your mercy, oh, yes. you allowed us to see another day on this earth. Yes. God, as we look back over our lives, God, we've seen all that you've done, the blessings, the joys, the peace. And we can't help but to tell you thank you. Thank you. If we had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough to give you praise. You've been so good to us. God, some of us don't even have to look back to last year and last month and last week. Some of us can see what you've done just today. And realize that's a thing to give you glory. God, so many of us have dealt with pains, problems, pressures, and predicaments over this past week, God. But we come today because we need a word. That will help us, God, to continue on in our each and every day life. We come today, God, as we support Minister Harry Horton. And we pray right now, as we begin this ordination service, that you will be with him. And as questions are asked, God, that you will be with him, that he will answer them to the best of his abilities. We thank you now for who he is, for who he is who you created him to be, God. We know, God, that he's already your preacher. So, God, we just tell you thank you now. Even in this service, as Pastor Moore stands today, we pray that you will give him a word, God, that will speak to each and every one of us, that will help us, that will challenge us, that will charge us in our each and every day lives. God, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
especially welcome our guest. And I want a beautiful lady to come and greet our guest today. And welcome you to our church. Her name is Courtney R. Franklin. Amen. She is my put on the spot for today. And um, I signed the papers. <laughs> and I take care of her so she don't move. <laughs> and she can use my money. To Pastor Franklin, to Pastor Moore, and to all of those who've gathered on this occasion, we're certainly grateful for the invitation to come and share with you as you uh, go through this process of ordination for our new brother. I'm, I'm from the old school, 35, 36 years ago when I was ordained, they made us sit in front. And so every one of uh, my sons have had to do the same thing. Langdon Brown, and we all have to sit in front and answer in front of the audience. But let me clarify some things. We're not here to embarrass him in any kind of way. Amen. Not here to try to trip him up or put him in a bad position. We are simply here to try to uh, 
ensure that he has the knowledge that he necessarily needs going forward. That's right. That's right. Any questions that we ask that if he does not know the answer to them, uh, we will make sure he know before he leaves. All of the council members will have an opportunity to, to ask a question if they so desire after I finish a certain list of questions that we will ask. Uh, brother, all I want you to do is answer to the best of your ability, all right? Just answer to the best of your ability. Don't, you ain't got to sweat yet. <laughs> I'll let you know when it's time to sweat. All right, you ready? All right. <laughs> you got it, Pop. Has, you got it. Your pastor scared you? Has he scared you? Just a little bit. A little bit. He told you I was coming, it's going to be hard, right? I'm glad he warned you ahead of time. <laughs> First question I do want to ask is um, Do you believe in your heart without any hesitation or many reservations that you are ready to be ordained? as the minister of the gospel. Yes, sir. Uh, that's the first question because that's important. Because regardless of what the pastor of the church may want for you, you have to be prepared to do this uh, for yourself and for God because uh, God's called you to ministry and this next step is an important step. You, you have to be ready to handle the tasks and responsibilities that come along with it. Who's the great head of the church? Sure. Can you get a mic for him? Let's get a mic for him to make sure he's not talking as loud as. No, I want you to hear about it. Let me ask that question again. Who's the great head of the church? Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Do you know the definition of a Baptist church? Uh, yes. Could you give it to us? The Baptist church recognizes and accepts Christ as their supreme Lord and lawgiver and takes his word as their only and sufficient rule of faith and patience in all manners of conscience and religion. What are three ways a person can be taken into a Baptist church that can become a member of the church? By letter, Christian experience, and baptism. When you say by letter, what do you mean by letter? A letter from their existing church written by the pastor to the pastor of the, of the coming to church. Right. Okay. This is a question that often, um, well, the actions behind it are not often carried out among churches, but it's important for us to understand from one church to another church. If disciplinary actions are exercised on an individual, and that church happens to withdraw the hand of fellowship, and that individual leaves that church and goes to the church down the road. Uh, what should be your action towards that individual? Let me ask you three. If, uh, suppose, suppose uh, something happens, some grievous act happens at a church, and uh, they go through the process according to scripture to try to gain that brother or sister back but that individual refuses to repent. And they have to go through the steps of withdrawing and the fellowship. Now that person leaves and comes to your church. What would, what would your actions be, or what does our doctrine teaches us that we how we should handle that situation? Okay, that's no, no problem. And the reason why I ask that is because so many times we do not even consider the church that they're leaving, why they're leaving, and the reasons they're leaving, and why the hand of fellowship was withdrawn. 
withdraw from them. Our number one first responsibility is to remember that as a Baptist church, even though they were sovereign bodies, we're still yet one church. Our first step is to contact the pastor from that church and try to understand why the hand of fellowship was withdrawn from them. Our duty is not just to take in members, but we're trying to gain souls of Christ, okay? And so our responsibility is not just to be concerned about if they have a membership church, but to get them back in fellowship with God. Once you get them back in fellowship with God, it's possible that the relationship can be restored between that church and the individual with the church that they left, okay? But sometimes we can be so, and I ain't trying to talk about it, nobody understand what I'm saying, all right? Sometimes we can be so hungry for members that we overlook the actions that were taken from our sister church. Okay. Um, well, since there are three ways to take a person into a church, there has to be at least some ways that a person can leave a church. There are three ways that you can leave a church. Do you know those three ways? Exclusion. Um, withdrawing the right hand of fellowship. That's exclusion. Then, go ahead, go ahead and sit again. And then, and then. Exclusion actually is the withdrawal of the hand of fellowship. Okay? That's the same thing, exclusion, withdrawal of the hand of fellowship. Death, of course, when you die. Uh, you might stay on the roll another 40 years. <laughs> You're not a member. <laughs> Dead exclusion. And then you said the other one earlier, it's the same thing. Letter. Letter. All right? Good, good, good. Um, what are the two offices of the Baptist Church according to Scripture? Pastor and deacon. Which one has the authority? Mm -hmm. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Can you name the tables of the church? Uh, benevolence, tithes and offering, and pastor's care. Amen. Amen. Um, what, this, what is the term that we use to describe the Baptist Church Declaration of Faith? All of the faith. Man, you've been studying. <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> that's uh, you on top of it. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to allow the members of the council if they would like to ask the question, they can do so at that time. Um, we believe in the separation of church and state. In recent years, laws within the United States have been passed that direct conflict with the traditional beliefs of the Baptist doctrine. Um, when the decrees of men contradict the word of God, what should we do? What should we obey? God's word. Amen. Amen. Does any member of the council have any questions you'd like to ask at this time? Go talk. Yes, sir. Uh, God's word is so important. Uh, we teach it, we teach it, we lean on it, and we trust on it, in it, we depend upon it. And so I want to know from you a scripture, your favorite scripture, that you lean on and trust in and watch. Uh, I, I, I lean heavy. I lean heavy. Uh, not just the one scripture, but the 23rd Psalms and the 27th Nautical Psalm. I, I lean heavy on them uh, in, in my prayer and in my communication with um, fellow brothers and, and deacons. I, I, I lean on them so much because I, I, I really appreciate and, and what David was saying and how David takes it, and especially in the 27th Psalm, how he takes it from one, from one extreme of confidence and then, then lays out his, his issues and then he brings it full circle. And, and that's how I, 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 I look at life 
and the life that I live and I try to live with my with my plan. We have all the confidence in the world, but here are the problems that we deal with. And this is how we need to, the same God that we have that confidence in with faith with our problems. It's the same God that we can take them to. And then at the end, we need to realize that we have to wait on him. And then David in the 23rd Psalm, it, 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 just, it just makes it so personal for me. So personal. And, and, and I, 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 I expound on that a lot. personal pronouns in that 23rd Psalm.
in July of 2019. I had, and, and I, when I shared this, I, I shared it, I said, you know, in my life and in my military life, I've always been faced with problems. Some I, I was able to address and deal with. Some I, I just merely walked away from. But in July of 2019, things began to happen with me and I just couldn't understand it. Uh, I was sick and I, my dear friend, my brother Bills, I was sitting and I would talk with him and I would tell him, I said, Bills, God is doing something here and I just do not know what it is. To be at home, sitting in the family room, uh, just thinking, I uh, think back those 15 years that I'm telling you about, I think back to those years as to how, what God brought me out of, and before knowing it, I'm praying and waking my wife up and I'm crying. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out, I couldn't figure out what was going on, and I went through 2019, Called pastor, I believe it was in November, and told him I needed to talk to him. But for some strange reason or another, I had many opportunities to talk to him because he was barely available for me. But I, I just I found a way not to talk to him. I just I just found a way not to talk to him. So I went through the holiday, and then and then I believe it was I believe it was in, in the latter part of February. I, I was I was on the way down. On, down 55, coming from the church, doing some work. And it, and it just hit me. And I called Pastor. I said, Pastor, I need to talk to you about something. And I pulled over to the side of the Dollar General parking lot, and, and I sat there, and I began to share with him what I had been experiencing, waking my wife up at night, crying, and just walking the floor, praying, and just to <laughs> I just couldn't. I just couldn't figure out. I mean, she, she walked. You okay? You know? But this, I, I just. And so I, I told Pastor. I called him. We talked about an hour. And and, and, and I told him, Pastor, I just don't know what this is. I don't know what it is. And so he told me. So I can't tell you what it is. Tell you what it is, and, and so we basically in our conversation. That way. He shared some stuff with me, he told me he couldn't, couldn't, he couldn't do it. So that was on uh, that was on Tuesday. When I, I, mean, I don't remember what day it was, but anyway, I, I, I went on off the phone, and, and I didn't come to didn't come to grips. I came back up to church, it was a Thursday, I came back up to church and did some work and went back to the house and, 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 and I walked in the house and it was about noon. I walked in the house and, and dirty, smelling tired. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I hid it for the shower, and, and, but I turned around and I came back down the hallway and. I got to the door going into the family room and I said, Lord, I accept this call. And it seemed like at that moment, somebody was behind me and just lifted the weights off my shoulder. And I was able to go take a shower and sit down and, and my wife came home that evening. I told her, I said, come on, I, need, I need to share something with you. She couldn't figure out what it was, and then I shared it with her. And we both just sat there for a minute. But it was a relief, and I just told someone a few minutes ago, I said, I'm going through this, I'm not running no more. I'm going through this thing.
City County with the way they were passed to Franklin, and we will come back momentarily.
at Dennis and whatever you done. <laughs> so it has been fun. I'm so glad he paid it off because he got a few more weeks that he can actually answer more to me. <laughs> okay. He's five or hundred dollars. So thank you. He's gonna do three dollars. So anyway, uh what come up with our series. But um, anyway, we're so grateful today to have my pastor here with us Amen. to preach. Uh, for us, not the first time preaching, but the first time preaching as my pastor. Amen. 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 And I love Pastor Moore. I enjoy our relationship, our friendship. I didn't want a pastor. I couldn't have a dialogue with. I couldn't be friends with. He and I would get up at 12 o'clock at midnight, 11 o'clock, stay all night at Dennis, eating and talking and just having a wonderful time together, especially when neither of us are sleeping. Sometimes we wake each other up and go and have a good time. And so we're so happy for he and for uh, Mrs. LaRose Moore. Amen. Was was a faithful member of this church. Amen. And so, I'm so happy that he found his wife. I'm really happy that he found his wife. But I just hate that. <laughs> I really wish we could have had church together or something to join together. <laughs> but we're so happy for them and for him and for her. And she's a beautiful lady. Amen. Inside and out. Portia is here and to each of you. Our choir is supposed to sing, but I've really been hearing them all day. And I don't really have to hear them again on this Sunday. And thank you so much for singing. And they sang yesterday at the funeral, so beautiful. When I get out here, they're gonna sing at my funeral. I mean, just, they're just gonna sing. But uh, as, of, as of now, I would like to hear Mrs. Monica Allen. Uh, I want her to come and do a sermonic solo for Amen. us today. Amen. And after, after she shall have finished, the next speaking voice you will hear is that of Pastor R.K. Moore, pastor of the Strong Hope yeah. Baptist Church here in Jackson. Yes, and after Pastor Moore is completed and done with this message, then we will move forward uh, with the hearing from the catechizer at, at that time. Correct. Correct. Okay. Well, Pastor, just so we be an audit, uh, the council recommends that at this time that we would move forward in the ordination of a brother. Uh, we find him, his answers to be acceptable and that is no reasons that we should hinder it any further. Amen. Amen. Thank you so, so, so much, uh, Council. Mrs. Monica Allen is going to come and lead us in music, and afterward, my pastor will come. Allow Monica to use that mic and Rick is going to get this cleaned up. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Give it over to God for the head of this church and all the ministers on the roster. God sent his son.
wonderful job. Um, that's one of the best kept kids I've ever heard. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, the Harry. Preaching comes before the fact. You understand that? Yes, sir. Preaching has to come before everything. Yes, sir. Preaching comes before your wife. Preaching comes before family. Yes, sir. Preaching comes before everything. Yes, sir. There is nothing more important than the preaching of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because folks cannot be saved without.
close, I call this father. My name is Father Carl Moore. Mm -hmm. People didn't understand. I call this father great one. Great one. He called me little. Little one. <laughs> and everybody would see him. I would call him that. People would try to tell him, what are they saying? Greater. You know, when we were calling him, nobody would call him. They didn't say great one. They called him that greater. Brother, today I want to take us to the gospel recorded, I'm sorry, the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1 and the 16 verse. I don't hold it long because I know that it's after noon and we have eaten. And we know what we'll be doing on Sunday afternoon at the church. We're not eating again and we lay it down and get some rest. But something has happened very important here today. Amen. We have ordained the preacher of the gospel. Amen. And that's important. Yes. And you want to thank him, I think about big business. That's big business. Oh, yeah. uh, the ordained the preacher of the gospel. Because the ordination now has taken place, and when this is over, the men will lay hands upon you. Uh, that gives you delegating authority to you uh, and to your pastor to license you to walk in the ministry. Yeah. Ordination uh, with the separation of church and state. Ordination makes the government look at you in a different light. You're exempt from certain things once you are ordained. You can't be called up in the reserves as an ordained preacher. You are a young preacher and you were called into the army. They would have to let you out because you have what you call ministry of privilege. And that's not conscience objective, but preaching. This church could write a letter and you, they would have to let you out. So now I say, no, that's not right. It is right because it happened to me. And, and you still receive the honorary discharge. That's the right of faith. That's the passage. Because even our government realizes that if people don't get saved on these streets, yeah. nobody will be able to live here. And so thank the Lord for calling you to, to preach. Romans 1, chapter 16 says these words. Romans 1 and 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Boy, yes. Boy, yes. For it is the power of God yes, yes. unto yes. salvation. To everyone that believe, yes. to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Amen. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. God is a good God. He's worthy of our praise. You know, shame has become a relatively uh, a term. Um, that's no longer relative in our world. There was a time, the same thing that brought shame upon a person 50 years ago doesn't bring shame anymore. 50 years ago, if you walked out of the house looking like some of these boys look who play basketball, your mom and dad would almost kill you. Because we woke up in the morning having to brush our hair comb our hair, brush our teeth, wash our face. There was a certain paradigm they expected. There was a certain world of life through their head. There was a special way they intended for you to look. You couldn't look in a kind of way. And although we were poor and didn't have much, you couldn't wear just anything. You had to leave the house for life. Not only did you have to leave right, you couldn't come back home looking just any kind of way. Because there was a tendency for people to be ashamed of you. And we heard that word so many times growing up, I'm ashamed of you. But you very seldom hear of that word shame. We've taken it out of our vocabularies. And in some places we've moved it out of our constitution where we don't talk about shame anymore. You can 
a point in time you could drive just as fast as you want. Somebody else was driving fast. You see each other in the street. You pass each other and just wave. Nobody bothered each other. But now if you pass somebody and look at them and park at the same red like a stop sign, you might have to run because nothing has any shame anymore. Shame was a common term growing up. Uh, we, we were ashamed of certain things, but the very things that shame would have shamed us now did not shame us then. Although looking a particular way shamed us, and our parents may have been ashamed, but now at the same time, today's world is no longer ashamed of what was shameful. You know, even even now, even now, if 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 you look a certain way, uh, even if you look good, good can now be shame. If you dress well, to some folk you dress it too old, or you dress it too conservatively, and they find shame in that which is which is good. Years ago, if you didn't have money. We made, we prayed for each other, but we weren't ashamed of each other. Where I come from, everybody didn't have a washing machine. Where I came from, not everybody owned a drive. But if you did have one, you weren't ashamed. Because the folk that had one allowed you to use theirs. And where I came from, you didn't have a service station where you could go down and buy bags of ice. When I was growing up, coming through town, there was a man called the Ice Man. And he brought blocks of ice. And he had ice on the truck. And they lifted the ice out of the truck. And we wrapped the ice in a blanket. And carried the ice in the house. We didn't have no good looking sink. Granite countertops. We carried the ice in the house and put it in the foot tub and cover the ice in the blanket. And the ice lasted until the ice man came again. Our little school in Dickens did not carry milk on the counter. Y'all hear me? It once a week would come the milk man. And we knew the milk man by his name. And if you didn't have any money to buy milk, neighbors would come together and put you some money together so you can have some milk in the house. Nobody laughed at each other. If you didn't have sugar, somebody brought you some sugar. If you didn't have salt, someone brought you some salt. There was no shame as it relates to us not having a particular thing. Everybody tried to be on one accord and we tried to be like the early church had things coming and we tried to share together. But we were not ashamed of one another. We wore sometimes the same pants on Monday. We wore them on Tuesday. Wore them again on Wednesday. Wore them again Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Wore the same thing until Sunday morning until we put on our Sunday go to meeting club. And we wore that on Sunday. But the same thing we wore Monday through Friday, we had to plan to wear it again the following Monday. And you wore them not one time and hung them in the closet, nor did you hang them on the garret. Somebody know what I'm talking about? But there come a time when holes would get into the knee. You went downtown and you brought patches and took the iron bowl. And the iron was not an electrical iron. My iron, it was a big steel iron. And you had to put wood in the stove and get it hot enough and lay the iron on the stove. And my grandmama could crease a pair of pans in 1950. Better than any cleaner can crease one now. And she put the patches on it and we wore it to school. And we were happy. Nobody was shamed of one another. But if you go out now, with patches on, they laugh at you. You go out now with a torn shirt on, you laugh at it. 
because they find shame in the thing that they ought not be shamed of. All of us are not at the same level in our lives. God loves us all, but we haven't grown to the same level. And therefore, we are not all blessed the same way. Some of us have more than others. But every one of us is walking in the divine grace. When it really boils down, every one of us is walking in a promise. God has promised us that he would stand by our side. God has promised us that he would supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, our Lord. But I want to tell you today that as a child of God, you need not be ashamed. No matter where you came from, no matter what your situation or stance has been in life, you have no reason to be ashamed as a child of God. And my dear brother today, you will have no reason forever to be ashamed having been called a preacher. Amen. Now, I find reason to say that as a son of a preacher, the word around town when we were growing up is that the preacher's children were the worst children in town. They said it so much until it made a shame to be called a preacher's children. It was because the expectations were so much higher than everybody else. Any small mistake you made was multiplied with words. It was multiplied to make it look as though you were worse than anyone else. You weren't as vicious as others, but it just seemed that way. You weren't as hurtful, as painful as others, but it seemed that way because you were the preacher's children. And whenever you did something, they said, oh, that's the preacher's boy. He ought to be ashamed of himself. And now, when you become a preacher, people tend to look at you from a different perspective. Now, before I go on into that, let me say this. It was some while ago that a church asked me to come. They were about to call a preacher, and they, the pulpit committee uh, wanted to meet with me to get some idea about this person they wanted to call. They said, Reverend, we like him. But you know, we, we, we look it into his background, and we found out that his credit ain't as good as we think it is. We look it in his background, and we find out that he's been into some trouble. He got to fight a few times growing up as a boy. Looked in his background and on his report card, and his 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years, he got a lot of D's and a lot of F's. We've looked at it, and we don't like all of that because most of the folk, we're kind of looking for us a, a perfect preacher. We're looking for a man who ain't got no scars, a man who ain't got no trouble. Looking for a man who ain't never been in nothing, who ain't never got nothing, who got stellar credit, who got money in the bank. I had to stop and say, now, where you're looking, you probably are not looking for a preacher. Because if you're going to call a preacher, if you're just calling him, you really call it a mess. But see, because a preacher had to be called out of something. You don't, you don't call, I don't know of one preacher on earth other than Jesus that comes without any baggage. Every preacher other than Jesus comes with much baggage until the Lord cleans up the baggage. You see, we come out of place of even as preachers after we pass a while. Things are not so stellar even after we've passed it for a while. Somebody said, well, 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 how come he ain't got a lot of money? Well, and how come this is happening? Well, you know, one reason in the black church the preacher didn't have any money is because the church didn't pay any. It. it has only been in the last 20 years that the black church has started to pay their pastor. We walked around waiting all year for our anniversary so we can pay the folk in the church that we owe their money back. Before we start borrowing somebody's other money from folk in the church because we were never cared for. How come he drive no jacked up car? Because he can't pay for a better one. How come his suits look cheap? How come his eyeglasses look like they came from the 10 cent store? Because he didn't have money to pay for them. They were not cared for when the scripture plainly tells us who goeth to warfare alone in his own charge. When you go in the army, they buy your uniform. When you go in the army, they buy your bus ticket. When you go in the army, they purchase your rifle. When you go in the army, 
They buy your books. They put you on a plane. They send you all the way to war. They feed you for nothing. They take care of your dental, all of your medical. They give you a retirement. They give you a pension. They take care of you for life because you can't go to war at your own charge. You can't get out here preaching folks' funerals not looking right. You can't get out here trying to marry people and, and with all jacked up clothing on. You can't get out here with no teeth in your mouth trying to represent the church. You got to look right. You got to walk worthy of the vocation wherein you have been called. If you can't look like a child of God, then don't try to walk in that walk. This man who writes to us in the book of Romans. The book of Romans deals with salvation by faith in Christ alone. Paul, 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 the apostle, Paul, who was once named Saul, writes this book of Romans. This no good, this no good for nothing man who, who was a rapist, who was a murderer. This no good man who tried to destroy the church ends up writing two thirds of the New Testament. He writes the epistles to explain the gospels because he wants us to really know what Jesus was saying to us. Paul now, after he has been changed from Saul, has now begun to write. And he tells us that first of all in Romans, that salvation is in Christ alone and that he is not ashamed of the gospel. In other words, there's nothing you do in order to get saved but believe in Jesus. Now, he that believeth is saved and is baptized, that's obedience after you're saved, you, then you are saved. And there is nothing that can change that. And let me go on the record today and tell you, once you are saved, you are always saved. Here is why a mighty God, a holy God, cannot save you on Monday and lose you on Tuesday. That's something a man do. Somebody says, well, you can lose yourself. I can lose myself because I did not save myself. The Lord saved me. He will have to lose me. And he told me that there is nobody that can pluck you out of his hands once we are in his hands. Paul says, I got it now, and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Paul declares openly, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And why would early Christians, uh, why would they be tempted to be ashamed of the gospel? Jesus was crucified. That was shameful to them. Because crucifixion was a shameful punishment. They didn't crucify people because uh, they, they, he, they didn't crucify him because he was just Christ. They didn't crucify him just because they didn't like him. But written in their laws, there was this statute. The statute said at that time, Pope, it said that if an individual claimed to have a certain authority in a certain place and does not ascribe to carry out the authority that they claim, they should be their crucifixion. They were saying that Jesus is not who we thought he was, nor is he who he says he is because the Romans were looking for a certain kind of Christ. Rather, the Jews were looking for a certain kind of Christ. They were looking for a lion out of the tribe of Judah. God didn't send a lion, he sent a lamb. They were looking for someone to deliver them, someone to fight their battle and kill the Romans. God did send someone to deliver them, but not deliver them from the Romans, but deliver them from themselves. And so they said, if this Jesus, talking about he loves everybody, walking around here giving sight to the blind, feeding 5,000 outside of women and children, walking around popping deaf folk ears and raising young boys out of their casket, this ain't what he came here for. What you gonna do with him? Put him on a cross and crucify him. And all my brothers and sisters, they said he didn't come to do what he said he was going to do. So he was looked at as a shame. But being a Christian wasn't upsetting every, was upsetting every norm of Jewish culture. Uh, the religion and their society. Because once you were a Christian, there were some things you didn't have to do any longer. You see, once you became a Christian, you no longer ascribe to the law. You, you, you knew the law, but you knew that you could not keep the law. 
and you knew that you did not have to keep the Ten Commandments. Because what the Ten Commandments does, they don't change anybody. What they do is, is tend to keep you from doing for the moment stuff that you end up doing. And then it regulates your good. Let me tell you what I'm saying. Listen. The, the Ten Commandments tend to, for a small period, keep us from evil. In other words, I tend to drive fast. If the law says drive 70 and you drive 7 to 1, you have broken the law. If it says drive 55 and you drive 56, you have broken the law. Oh no, they give you five miles over. The law is still broken. The five miles they give you is something called grace. You have broken the law. You have broken the law. So the, the Ten Commandments tend to help me refrain for a period of time from evil. And then, second thing it does, it regulates my good. The, how does it regulate the good? It allows me to look at myself in a mirror and understand the thou shall not process. And out of all the things we thou shall not, there are some things we thou shall do when we thou should not do. In other words, if you went out one night, you can be so holy and so good until you regularly come to the movie one night and you saw a man in the movie with somebody other than his wife and you decide you're going to go back and tell tale to tell her that you saw him your good needs to be regulated because you got no business in somebody else's business. Because what you can do is go back and tell her she pack up and leave home and God looks at you and says to you, I told you, don't you take apart nothing that I put together. Are y'all here this evening? And all my brothers and sisters, here it is. They were upset with the law because once you became a Christian, you no longer as a man had to be a Jew before you be a Christian. And so you no longer needed circumcision. Can you think of a 60 year old man receiving Christ having to go and be circumcised? But once you became a Christian, you no longer had to be circumcised. And it upset the Jewish culture until the point where people got ready to fight. And in, I believe, the 16th chapter of Acts, there was the first convention that they ever had in the church. And the reason they had the convention was we've got to get rid of the notion that you've got to be a, a, a Jew before you can be a Christian. Now, if salvation is going to save me, then I don't need circumcision. If salvation is going to save me, I don't have to keep all the commandments in order to get saved. I can't keep what I don't know, but I can keep what I do know. I know Jesus and being a Christian, that's enough. Peter stands up on the floor of the convention. Peter tells everybody, now if you're going to be a Christian, you need to be a Jew first. You get circumcised, we'll make you a Christian. James stood up on the floor of the convention, and that's how you ought to have a church meeting. You see, when you have church meeting, you're not come with knives and guns. When you come to church meeting, you're not come to kill the pastor. When you come to a church meeting, you ought to come to instill intellectual thought. To talk about what needs to be done, not what we've done, and where the money going. And most of the time, the first that asks the question of where the money is going, you're going to get there one day if you have a pastor. People who ask where all the money is going are folk who don't pay in the first place. And most of the time, when they want to know where the money is going, all you need is a dollar and eighteen cents, and that's enough to get a lint belt and a and, and a stamp and give them their letter because they ain't doing nothing no way. Are y'all hearing me? They have said every norm of Christian culture. Now they were ashamed of it, but there was much to celebrate about the gospel. God has called you to preach his gospel. And preaching the gospel is not a friendship thing. No, 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 no. If, if you preach, you're going to make folk mad. Sometimes the preacher preach, he make me mad. And I carry the same word he got, but let me tell you, this word is like a two-edged sword. It'll cut you between the marrow and the joint of bone. 
And sometimes God preach, almost preach me under the chair. Because let me tell you, every one up in here got some stuff we don't always do right. It don't have to be made to stuff, but we still don't do it right. Some of us eat too much. That's a sin. Some of us just greedy. It. It's a sin. And then there's another sin we don't talk about. Some of us are just too doggone stingy. You'll give everybody else anything, but you don't want to give the law nothing. And he woke you up this morning. So there are sins that we commit without smoking and drinking, which are not sins in the first place. Those are errors in your growth. That's a whole other subject. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't turn that water to wine. If he did, there wasn't no alcohol in it. It was potent. The man said they saved the best unto the last. And don't come tell me you don't drink, but if you do, do it in the dark. Don't let anybody know what you do like that. Yeah. I'm too young. But you have a witness today. But God forgives us all. There's much to celebrate about the gospel. And in verse 16, you have to look at it when you get home. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. I'm not ashamed because there is redemption. Say redemption. There is redemption. And to be redeemed in simple terms means to just be picked up out of the garbage can. And everyone has been picked, every one of us, we've been picked up out of a spiritual garbage can. Because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned and, and we've come short of the dozo of God. We, we have sinned and we've come short of the glory. That word sin and glory, that word glory means dozo and dozo is short for repetite and repetite is short for reputation. That means all of us have come short of the reputation of God. We've done some stuff that God just don't do. But I'm not ashamed because the power of God is in us now. We don't walk around with our heads down because we carry the power of God. We are not politicians. We all don't own great businesses, but you know what we got as people of God? We got God's word. And you don't never have to hold your head down when you got the word of God on your side. That's why you can love those who despitefully use you. That's why you can love those who talk about you and put their foot on you because you are a child of the king. Mark says, Jesus has given us power to become sons of God. Look, I ain't got time to worry about your mess. I'm a child of God. And if I'm a child of God, I'm not out to what God has. And I'm in God's will. I don't have time to worry about what you're thinking. I'm waiting on the Lord to give me what I got in his will. And everything I need is in the will of God. The earth is the Lord's. The fullness that will the world and they that dwell therein. All I have to do is just wait on it because it's going to come. I said, come y'all. I know what it means to be broke. And I'm talking about showing up broke. Preacher, I know what it means. I know what it means. I know what it means to, to be hungry. I know what it means to be at a point where you didn't drive a nice car. I had a Cadillac. I had a Cadillac that I drove so long, Pope, until one day it sat down in the middle of Highway 55. I mean, the car literally sat down and said to me, I can't take no more. I can't go no further. It sat down. The speedometer was going left and right, telling me I can't go no further. I have bad all I can bear. But if you trust in the Lord, he'll fight your battle. Do I have a witness? If you trust in him, he'll fight your battle. If you trust in him. Oh, there is redemption. I'm not ashamed of it. And in verse 17, the writer tells us, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Not only is there redemption, there is revelation. For the gospel of righteousness. God reveals it to us, Terry, from faith to faith. If I stay with the Lord, if I find my way down to Neway Station, God promised me that he would give me the desires of my heart. He promised me that he would give them to me if I ask, it shall be given. See, 
I shall find. He's going to give it to me, but he does not give me a time. All I know is that his time is different from my time. I have to be willing to wait because one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day, but I do know this. All I got to do is wait. If I wait on the Lord and be patient, the Lord will give us the desires of our heart. Not only is there redemption, there is revelation, but not only is there revelation, there is reconciliation. Verse 17 says, it is the righteousness of God. Righteousness. Oh, my brothers and sisters, thank God for his righteousness. What is righteousness? It ain't doing right. It's a little deeper than that. What is righteousness? It's not being a do-gooder all the time. It's a little deeper than that. Righteousness comes through a word called justification. A word which means in the Greek, the key or oh. It simply means that being made right. You see, the only people who are truly right are those who have been made right. You see, the Lord justified Abraham. That means he imputed righteousness in him. Abraham wasn't always right. Anytime you go down and lie and tell the king that your wife is your sister. But yet the Lord says, you're a righteous man. David killed a man just to have his wife. God turned around and called him the apple of his eye. A man after his own heart. Because God had put righteousness in him. You see, righteousness does not come from seals and robots. Righteousness doesn't come from J.C. Penney's. You can't find righteousness at Cole. You got to get your righteousness from God. And if God makes me right, no one can take away the righteousness that I have. When you've been made right, God expects you to grow in his grace. So that when the enemy comes upon you as a flood, God will give you the power to rise above the flood and water. God has the power to take you where he needs to carry you. Reconciliation and the righteousness of God was bought by God. It was bought by him through the divine blood of Jesus Christ. But not only was it bought by God, righteousness was brought by God. It was bought and it was brought. It was brought to us by the incarnation. The man that was once with God in the beginning. Before there was or there was. Before the Lord stepped from the backside of the eons of eternity. Jesus Christ was with him. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. The word was with God. Not anything that was made was made by him. Everything we see, God made it. Everywhere you go, God takes us. You can't spend your life living in the real view mirror. You better look out your windshield. Because if you spend your life looking in your real view mirror, you're going to walk around being ashamed. But you've got to look toward the hills from which come at your head. All of your hair comes from the law. Thank God for redemption. Thank God revelation. Thank God for reconciliation. But most of all, thank God for relationship. Verse 17 says, the just shall live by faith. In other words, when God fix you, when God takes you down by the potter's house, and when the Lord works on you, when God makes you a little better, you're willing to do better. You can't do better until you know what's better. You can't know what's better until God tells you what's better. Every once in a while, Jesus has got to take us down to the potter's house. Every now and then, you're going to see the potter working on the wheel. I see the potter with a vessel in his hand. The vessel got my name on it. the mask 
the trail. That God of mine knocked him off his horse. Called him by his name. Saul. Oh, Saul. Why you gonna persecute me? Who are thou? I'm Jesus. Your best way. I don't know way. I'm Jesus.
And if you preach it, and they don't hear his word, shake the dust off your feet. And the dust will testify against them. He never promised you a flower bed of ease. But he said he'll see you through. He is going to be your best friend. Love Jesus. Family, your church. Love your preacher. Love your pastor. If you can't help him, don't hurt him. Preachers got enough for hating them. And they don't, they're not hating them because the preachers. They don't want to hate them. It's deeper than that. They, 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 they hate them because Jesus says you shall be hated for my name's sake. If you love the Lord, you can't be his best friend and the devil's best friend. Too. Jesus ain't gonna ever share his stage with the devil. He's too big, too clean. But what you can do always is preach. You don't ever have to go anywhere else to ask him about let you preach. It's unethical. Your pastor know when you need to preach at home. And he'll open the door. And if you preach and be humble, other doors will open. That no man can close. And when God gives you church and they want to start you off with $30 a week, take it. I know that because I've had one. <laughs> had one that gave me a chicken for my anniversary. I'm not talking about a deep fried chicken, I'm talking about a live chicken. <laughs> In a cage. Yes, it is. Gave me a chicken. But they gave it from their hearts. They gave me a thousand dollars for my anniversary and a chicken. Because they wanted my wife to cook it. But God changes things. Yeah. Wife I had then would have probably cooked it, but God's given me a little wife. She ain't gonna cook it. <laughs> but they give you thirty dollars a week. Take it. Because the folks give it from their hearts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when God elevates you, if some give you 200, and somebody bring you 10, put in a frame and frame the 10 for you. Love them too. They may have 10,000 in their pocket and give you five. Love them. Even though the church has asked them to give to you, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. They're children. They're sheep who need a shepherd. Do all you can to protect this church, its ministry, and its pastor. And when God elevates you, don't ever forget about home. Because if you get another church, a church next week, you better believe me, you're going to need unity one day. Because sometime God will send you out as a lamb among wolves. And you're going to need the sheep of God to come get you with their shepherd. I'm going to pray for you. Pray for your wife, for your family. I'm going to pray for your ministry. That you be instant in season and out of season. I know what it means to be built up. I know what it means to be a beast. I've been out here 42 years. And it hasn't been easy. But God is good. He's good. He's a mighty God.
God for the word today. We're so blessed by the word we've heard today. Amen. And that was a, an assumption is that somebody was blessed and perhaps there may be someone who would like to come and join the church today and be saved today. And we would dare let you leave here without that opportunity.
with one of your own handmade siblings. Lord, one whom you call to share the gospel of Jesus the Christ. Lord, we come now to lay hands upon him. And Lord, we come now asking, oh God, now that you would strengthen him where he may be weak. We ask, oh God, now that you would build him up where he may be torn down. And Lord God, now as he walk in this walk that you call him to walk, Lord, I pray, oh God, now that you walk with him, that he be reminded of the promise that you made him, and lo, I am with you, always, even unto the end of the world. And then, oh God, we pray now as you walk the walk. Lord God, there's going to be some trials and some tribulations that uh, will confront him in this ministry. But Lord, as you told, Paul told Timothy, endure the hardness as a good soldier. Lord, knowing that one of these old days, that you do have a reward waiting for him. Lord, I pray for him now. I pray his strength now, oh God. Lord, not only that, but I pray for his wife. I pray, oh God, now as you stand with him and stand beside him. I pray, oh God, now that you would give her understanding. Lord, because there are times in her life that you will not understand. But Lord, strengthen her now. Give her a mind to be able to stand with her husband. To encourage him, oh God, when his way seem dark, when his fields seem hard to climb. Lord, I pray, oh God, now that you bless him. Bless his entire family, oh God. That they surround him with love. To encourage him, oh God, as he go forth in ministry. Lord, we thank you now. Lord, we give you all the glory. And Lord God, we give you praise. In the mighty and the precious name of Jesus the Christ. We pray in the saints of God. Said Amen. amen. twice himself talked about what an experience it was for him and he won't 
his pastor to go. Amen. And I know that this church is going to do whatever he asks to send their pastor to the Holy Land. Am I yeah. right? Yeah. Amen. I know you are. And so there's so many different things that he's orchestrated for me and for my ministry. And I thank the men this morning and I thanked him as well and I thank him again this afternoon for his faithfulness and for his stewardship. Yeah. And I can give him an assignment, a task. I say very little to nothing. I say, Harold, I need to get this done. And he's right on it without hesitation. And so I feel happy today Amen. to be able to ordain uh, Minister Harry Horton on this day, the 20th day of February 2000. 22. Amen. 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 Last year he orchestrated that the, the men uh, did extremely well for the pastor's anniversary. Right. And so I can just imagine what, what an ordained preacher going to do. Ain't no telling what an ordained preacher is. <laughs> 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 they have, ain't no telling what to be outside. <laughs> <laughs> We're just happy today, and I want him to stand. I was making a joke uh, to a degree, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> the certificate of ordination. We, the undersigned, above the recommendation and request of the Unity Fellowship Baptist Church 5609 Clinton Boulevard, Jackson, Mississippi. A full and sufficient opportunity for judging the God-given gifts and after satisfactory examination by us in regard to the Christian experience, call to the ministry and views of Bible doctrine, hereby certify that Reverend Harry Horton was solemnly and publicly set apart and ordained to the work of the gospel ministry Amen. by authorized in the authority and order of the Unity Fellowship Baptist Church, again, 5609 Clinton Boulevard, Jackson, Mississippi, 39209, on the 20th day of February 2022. Amen. 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 beautiful day this is.
soon. chance to give. The offering will go to Minister Harden today. Amen. Amen. It will not go to the pastor. It will go to the other preacher. Amen. Need a lot of books. Can't give them all mine. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I'm going to allow Minister Horton the privilege to come for a few moments. He shall have finished. My pastor will come and dismiss us, and we will go down on this place. Amen. Amen. Were you blessed today?
God. Oh, I thank God. I thank God.